Recording started. Okay. So, um, again, I hope my voice will come through okay here with the cold, but um, let's go for it. Good stuff. All right, so let's read the first question here. So it says, uh, list the three properties of ionic and molecular compounds that differ and explain how they differ. So I've written down here in the blue text, the first difference is the boiling temperature, second is electrical conductivity, and the third is hard hardness. So do you remember with ionic compounds how they rate in each one of these categories? Like how are they in boiling temperature, electrical conductivity, and hardness? Okay, so would they have a low boiling temperature, high boiling temperature? Okay, it's actually a high boiling temperature because for something like salt, it, it's really hard to boil or to melt. Okay, and how about electrical conductivity? Okay, well, you probably don't have to write it down because you can look at this later on, eh? So we just want to kind of keep on track here. So, okay, the electrical conductivity is going to be high for salts, right? Because they've got a charge. They've got two different charges. And that's right. And if you think about it, uh, you know, you think about salt water is going to have a high conductivity. That's why lie detectors are working on the principle of your sweat, right? Because your sweat is going to conduct more electricity. So if you're lying, then it's going to, you're going to produce more sweat. And it's going to produce, um, it's going to conduct the electricity, right? And you're right. Uh, the hardness is going to be high for ionic compounds. And then molecular compounds are going to be the whole opposite sort of spectrum, right? So for boiling temperature, it's going to be low. Electrical conductivity is low. And hardness is going to be low as well. So, you know, when you're looking at molecular compounds, you're looking at solids at room temperature. Sorry, I mean ionic compounds or solids, and molecular compounds are going to be liquids or gases, right? Okay. So that's pretty well that. And we'll go on to the next screen. I think the next screen might just be a summary. Okay. So for ionic compounds, you can see the three points we've got there. An example is table salt or NaCl. Molecular compounds, you've got an example of pneumonia. <laughs> I should say ammonia. <laughs> That's the thing the kids always get mixed up on it. Eh? Let's be with my cold, I got that one mixed up. Okay, ammonia. Uh, so you can see the three characteristics there. Okay. And so let's go on to the next question then. So for the next question, number 13, it says explain how you can predict whether a compound is ionic or molecular by looking at a formula such as MgO or NH3. Okay, so just a reminder, ionic compounds are formed by a metal combined together with a nonmetal. The first, the first part of the name is always the metal, the second part is the nonmetal. Molecular compounds are nonmetal plus nonmetal. Okay? So just looking at the two compounds we've got in this question, MgO and NH3, which one do you think, and I and I wrote a mistake here. Oh, hi Naomi, how's it going? Good. That's okay. So uh, I was telling Jaron I've got a bit of a cold here. So um, oh, making breakfast. Did you make some for the rest of us? Just attach it to an email, eh? What are you having for breakfast? Milkshake? Yeah, I think Jaron and I haven't had breakfast. Not fair. Ooh, smoothie protein shake. I was talking about protein shakes with Mr. Smart on the way back from our meetings up north. Very cool. Good if you've been working out, eh? So hey, uh, Naomi, we've got uh, the three of us for now. And uh, we might have some other students join as well. But we're just going for it. And we're on question number 13 here. So it tastes good, eh? Yeah, I bet it's good. We'll just have to imagine. All right, so we're on question number 13 here, and it says, explain how you can predict whether a compound is ionic or molecular by looking at the formula, such as MgO or NH3. And so uh, just a reminder here in the blue text, ionic compounds are equal, uh, uh, they're formed by metal plus nonmetal, and compounds, uh, molecular compounds are nonmetal plus nonmetal. Okay? 
So the question I'm asking here, and I should have written down which of the two compounds is a molecular compound and which is an ionic compound. Okay, so ignore where it says which is a metal and a non-metal. Okay, so which one, MgO, do you think that's a molecular or an ionic compound? That's right, MgO is ionic, you're right, because Mg is in the beginning of the periodic table, it's a metal, always at the right side of the periodic table, so it's a non-metal. So NH3, it's the opposite, it's a molecular compound, both N and H are going to be non-metals. Okay, so let's go on to the next screen, and uh, just written down what we had there. Scroll on to screen four. Okay. Now this question here is asking us to name different sorts of compounds. And we've got a variety here. Now some of these compounds are going to have elements in them, some are going to have polyatomic ions, some have a combination. NH3 is ammonium. Um, NH3 is actually ammonia, and it's ammonium when it's NH4+. Okay? So it's close though, right? Okay, so let's look at the text we've got here as far as the rules. So I said remember these rules as we work through the problems. So question, or point number one I should say, with ionic compounds with subscripts or little numbers don't affect the way we name them. So with MgCl2 it's not magnesium dichloride, it's just magnesium chloride because it's an ionic compound. But we see a different situation with molecular compounds because in this situation the subscripts or little numbers do affect the way we name them. So when we have something like N2O4, this is dinitrogen tetraoxide, okay? So we need to remember that important distinction right out, the, uh, out at the beginning. So uh, again, ionic compounds, metal plus nonmetal, molecular compounds, nonmetal plus nonmetal. Okay, let's go to the next screen and do the first one. So the first one here is going to be SO3. And uh, here, I've kind of given away the answer here, but got to... Uh, there we go. Uh, SO3, is this an ionic compound or a molecular compound? What do you think? Yeah, that's right. It is molecular because both S and O are on the right side of the periodic table. They're non-metals. So what do you think this, uh, the name of this compound would be, SO3, if it's molecular? Sulfur trioxide. That's right. Okay, so molecular compounds are fairly easy that way. In, in you, just, you just use the uh, subscript to help you name them. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Oh, okay, I wrote something here. Now, this wasn't part of the question. I said, if this compound had been ionic, what would its name be? So let's just go back and look. SO3. What would we call it if it had been ionic? Sulfur oxide, good stuff. Right on. Okay, so next question. K2CO3. So, because you don't use the prefixes with ionics, exactly. So is this next one going to be ionic or molecular? K2CO3, what do you think? Okay, this is going to be ionic. The reason it's going to be ionic is because you have CO3, which is one of those polyatomic ions, okay? And then we know that K is also going to produce an ion. So we've got two ions here, okay? So this is an ionic compound. We also know that K is metallic, so we know that it's a metal and non-metal. So I just wrote here, we know from the periodic table, good, we know from the periodic table that K is K+, plus, and we also recognize CO3. You're right, CO3 is a non-metal, and what we need to do is, that's a polyatomic ion, right? The whole thing, CO3, 2 minus, functions as if it's one group, one ion, even though it's a whole bunch of atoms together. Okay, so please have a look at page 12 in your textbook, and that's got the chart with all the names of the polyatomic ions. 
But what I would recommend doing is memorizing these ones, at least the most common ones. Like I wouldn't memorize um, ethanoate, the first one, but I would memorize ammonium, the second one, and I would memorize uh, carbonate. And you want to memorize these because that way, when you come across something like this, you don't have to look at the chart. It's just bang, bang, it's there, right? Okay. So we know that this is carbonate, and we know the two things we have are potassium, K plus, and carbonate. Here, I'll just get my little pointer out. Okay, so here we are, K plus and carbonate. And so what are we going to call this compound? K2CO3. What do you think? Potassium carbonate. That's right. Good stuff. Pretty straightforward, right? In this case, because we knew it was ionic, we didn't really even have to write it out uh, the way we did, break it down. The answer is on the bottom. It is, isn't it? Okay. Um, I didn't think you could see the bottom. <laughs> I thought I was able to make it kind of smaller there. You can still see it, eh? Okay. Huh. So much for trying to be sneaky. Okay, so um, so you didn't really have to write out the K plus and the CO3 two minus. If you looked at K2 CO3 and you just recognized that the CO3 part was carbonate and you knew that the K part was potassium, you'd just be able to write it out. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Good, so we know that's potassium carbonate. Let's go to the next one. Next one is P4... <laughs> All right, well... If I could quickly, I would uh, do something here to get rid of this. I knew how to, but I don't. So just ignore the answer for the moment, please. Is it ionic or molecular? Yeah, I could use a little white box. That's probably a good idea. Let me see if I can cover it. Uh, but I need to know. Hmm. Anyways, it's a molecular compound. I'll, I'll fool with that later on and try to figure it out. Uh, so what do we call the compound then? Tetraphosphorus, because there's four phosphorus, decaoxide, ten oxides, right? Ten oxygens. Okay. So that one's not too bad. We just have to memorize all those tri, tetras, decas, and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, so the next one... And hopefully, you won't be able to see the answer for this one yet. So the next one, I wrote down, when we look at the polyatomic ions on page 12, we recognize NH4 plus is the ammonium ion. HCO3 is known as the bicarbonate ion. Another way of calling it is the hydrogen carbonate ion. You can call it either way, either thing. doesn't matter. Okay? So I put the two ions side by side. Okay, you can see them over here. And so what are we going to call this beast? We're going to call it a compound. Right? What do we call this compound? It's one compound, that's right. The NH4 is the beginning part. The HCO3- is the, the second part. What do you think we're going to call it? Okay, what do we call this part? NH4 plus. Do you remember, Naomi, we talked about it before? Ammonium, right? And what do we call this? Based on this up here? Okay, so we could either call this ammonium bicarbonate or we could call it ammonium hydrogen carbonate. Good stuff. Okay, going on to the next screen. I got the answer there. Ammonium bicarbonate. This time I was smart and I put it on the next page. Okay. <laughs> so next question it says write the chemical formula for the following compounds. Okay, so we need to change the chemical name into a chemical formula. And we've got all different types here. We've got some that have these numbers, these Roman numerals, and we'll see what they mean in a bit, uh, but some of them don't. So I wrote down three steps to write, help us write chemical formulas for compounds. We use three different sources. And I spelt it wrong here. Uh, number one says periodic table. So we use that to find the charge on ions. 
Uh, the second thing we can do is use that common polyatomic ion chart on page 12. And the third thing is the prefixes. So if the name contains a prefix, then we know it's a, it's a molecular compound, right? Otherwise, we use steps one and two if it's an ionic compound. Okay, so those are the steps to find a chemical formula. So, let's look at the first one. Okay, so the first one we're going to do, we're not going to do all of these. First one we're going to do is calcium hydroxide, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, what's that about Wiki uh, Wikipedia, Jaren? Yeah, it seems like holes are going around, eh? I think mine's on its way out, fortunately. Sore throats, exactly. Yeah, Wikipedia is good, for sure. I think I gave my wife my sore throat, so how's that for sharing? <laughs> Uh, okay, so calcium hydroxide, uh, so in this case, we don't see any reason to think, yeah, that's, that's kind, eh? Um, we don't have any reason to think that calcium hydroxide is a molecular compound, uh, and we think that it's an ionic compound because it's got hydroxide in it, which is an ion, and so um, and we also know that calcium is a metal, so we know it's going to be an ionic compound. So we know we can't just look at the prefixes, we're going to use the periodic table. So from the periodic table, we look on it, and we see the calcium is plus two. It forms plus two ions when it's in a chemical reaction. And if we would look on that chart on page 12, we know that hydroxide is OH. It's a really simple one, so we can just memorize it, right? OH minus. So the ions we get, I'll just use my little pointer here, are Ca plus two, OH minus. And now, remember, when we're, whenever we're uh, creating a formula, we need to switch the charges. So we have plus two up above calcium, and when we switch the charge, we bring that plus two down below hydroxide. And we started with a minus one up above hydroxide, and we bring that, we, we don't make it a minus one, we ignore the minus and plus, we just bring down a plus one after the calcium. So that's what's called switching charges. We bring whatever above the one element down below the other element. So now we've got CA1OH2. And we can, if it's CA1, we can ignore the 1, so we just make it CA, and we have to put brackets around the OH2. And the reason is, if we just did OH and had a 2, that would mean we have two H's. But we don't have two H's, we have two OH's, because it was OH that was in the reaction, right? So that's our final, that's right, 2 is the whole deal. So that's our final answer. CaOH2, calcium hydroxide. All right? So that's the first one. Let's move on to the next. All right. Sulfur dioxide. Air pollution. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what two elements must have formed this compound? Well, we know that the sulfur, that sulfur tells us it's S, and dioxide tells us it's oxygen, right? Okay, and so what are the prefixes in the name? <coughs> I'm sorry, my throat's. <coughs> what are the prefixes in the name? Tell us about the number of each type of atom. Okay, well, sulfur just tells us we've got sulfur, <coughs> and dioxide tells us we've got the prefix two. We've got two oxygens. So we can just use the name, and we can get SO2 as the chemical formula. So with a molecular compound like this, it's easier to find the chemical formula. Well, sometimes it's easy with the ionic ones as well. But uh, this one was pretty, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, pretty straightforward. Let's go on to the next one. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Okay. So, mercury to sulfide. So, sometimes this is an, uh, an area where it's a little bit ambiguous. You're right, Jeremy. It's the mercury tells us that it's Hg plus 2. So first of all, we're looking at what two elements do we have. We have HG. That comes from Latin, in case you're wondering, you know, why do you, why do you get HG for most elements? Uh, like CA, it's, it makes sense because calcium starts with CA, but the HG comes from Latin. And so we get HG and S. Okay, so you're thinking it's HGS2. 
Okay. Well, let's just look at it really quickly then. We've got Hg plus 2, S minus 2. That's what we've got for two ions. Okay. And now we're going to switch the numbers, bring them down. We're going to have Hg2, S2, like you said, Naomi. You guys are both saying. But then we need to reduce it to simplest form. And so we're going to have HgS. Because we always need to, just like a fraction, you know, if you have four eighths as a fraction, you need to reduce it to one half. Same thing with chemical formulas. So we divide two into both. That's right, they cancel out and we get HgS. We could have Hg1, S1, but we just make it HgS. Okay? So I want to bring out another point here. And that is, at the top of the screen here I wrote, please notice, Based on this chemical formula, we could come up with the name mercury 2 sulfide. So if you were going in the opposite direction, if I told you, <coughs> well, that's cool, Jared. If I told you that you had HGS, and I said, well, what's the name for this? What's the chemical name? You could say to yourself, well, I know that S is minus 2, and I know that HG must be plus 2, because they must cancel out to give me this HGS. Okay, so you could use that reasoning to decide that it's got to be mercury 2 instead of mercury 1, because mercury 1 is the other option that mercury can have. Okay? So that's just kind of a point of interest. So the next one is going to be ammonium nitrate. You bet. So question here, it says, which two elements or ions must have formed this compound? And we know that ammonium is NH4 plus, we get that from page 12, and nitrate, nitrite, if you look on page 12, is NO2 minus. Okay? So the two ions we have are NH4 plus, NO2 minus. We've got a plus one and a minus one. We switch the numbers. We could write down a little one beside each of them, but we're not going to because we know they're going to cancel out in the end. So when we get to the point where we can kind of predict that, we don't even have to do that as part of the process of writing it out. Now if we had something like uh, a one at the top of one and the two at the top of the other, then we have to remember that when we bring down those subscripts, when we do the switch, that we're going to put a brackets around the NH4 or around the NO2, whatever the case would be. Okay? So this is the chemical formula, NH4, NO2. That's ammonium nitrite. All right. So whip it right along. On to the next question. So we're done with these naming chemical formulas. Just went through some examples here. So question 35 says, why does water have a much higher melting point and boiling point than other molecules? Usually if a substance has a high melting point, it tends to have a high boiling point as well. Okay, so you're saying it's hydrogen bonds. Yeah, you're right. And so comparing water to ammonia and methane, uh, both water and ammonia have hydrogen bonds, but methane, CH4, does not have hydrogen bonds. Now let's just review it again. What is it that causes hydrogen bonds? Well, it's when one element has a high electronegativity, right? It really, really wants its electrons. So when it's sharing a bond with another element, another atom, uh, this element with a high electronegativity is going to pull all the electrons towards itself, giving it a negative charge and the other atom a positive charge. So with water, the oxygen, has a really high electronegativity, and it pulls the electrons to itself. It's got a negative charge. The hydrogen has a positive charge. Okay, so the reason then that water has a high melting point and boiling point has to do with this high electronegativity of oxygen. So let's go on to the next page. Okay, so I'm comparing here hydrogen and oxygen. I'm just writing down the bond. That's what we're showing right here. So we've got the bond, and we see that this is going to be negative for oxygen because it's got the high electronegativity and hydrogen is going to be positive. So I wrote here that the bond is going to be strongly polar. And if you look at the difference between the electronegativity of H, it's going to be 2.2 and oxygen is going to be 3.4. If you subtract those two numbers, you're going to get a large difference. It's going to be 1.2. And so you're going to get a very polar bond. Now with ammonia, you still get a polar bond. You're still going to have a plus on the hydrogen, a minus on the uh, nitrogen, but it's going to be moderately polar because when we subtract the two numbers, they're not going to be as large as 1.2. It's going to be 0.8. So we've got a medium difference in electronegativity. And when we go to methane, where we have hydrogen and carbon, 
If you subtract the two numbers, you only get 0.4, which is pretty small. So we can say that they're not polar. Now, you can't always tell by looking at it that it's not polar. You could say that it's weakly polar. Um, there is a certain cutoff whereby you say this isn't even polar. And uh, I, I think there is a number that's a cutoff. I can't remember what it is right now. Okay. So, uh, okay, so does this question make sense, guys, where we're coming from with this? The fact that you've got a high polar bond. So remember, guys, we do have the test coming up, right? We've got that coming up in you know, October the 6th, right? Yeah. So that's going to be on lessons one to four. So please fire away any questions that you have on lesson four. All right, so I summarized things here. I said water has strong hydrogen bonds, very polar, so it's got a high boiling point. Uh, and ammonia, moderate hydrogen bonds, polar, uh, medium boiling point, and methane, no hydrogen bonds, so it has a low boiling point. Okay? So that's the reason. So because water's has these strong hydrogen bonds, the water molecules want to stay together. So they don't want to break apart, which is what boiling does. So that's why it has a high boiling point. So that's number screen 13. On to the next one. OK, next one is talking about these electric negativity values. And it says, use these electronegativity values to indicate the polarity of the bond in each of the cases below. Now. <coughs> when it says indicate the polarity of the bond, um, it needs a little clarification here. You could look at it and you could say, well, they want me to find the actual number. They want me to, to look at the electronegativity value for nitrogen and hydrogen and subtract the two and find the number. But they, this is not exactly what it means here. What it means is find out, when it says polarity, it means like it's kind of like the polarity of a magnet. Tell which side is negative, which side is positive. So that's what this question is asking. So I just wrote down uh, polar bond results when there's a large difference between the electronegativity values of the two elements. That's kind of from the last question. So what we do here then, we need to figure out which side is positive and which is negative. So what we do is we go to the electronegativity table on page 36. It looks kind of like a periodic table, but it, it looks different. Um, and when we go there, we find the following values. So I just wrote them down here. So nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.04. As you can see, fluorine is very high. It really wants electrons, just like oxygen does. And that's not surprising. It's in the same areas of the periodic table as, as oxygen, or, or similar, right? OK, so now we want to figure out which side is positive, which is negative. So I just wrote down the electronegativity of nitrogen is 3.04. 2.20 for hydrogen. And so we know that the one that has a higher electronegativity wants the electrons more, so that side is more negative. So we can see that nitrogen has a higher EN value, so it's going to be the negative side, and hydrogen is going to be the positive side. Okay? So I just wrote this down here. I just wrote down that nitrogen is the negative side, hydrogen is the positive side. Okay? So that's all we need to do for this one. And this is just an example. You needed to do all three of these. And then I just wrote at the end, I said we subtract to find the difference in the end value. So we could have taken the values, 3.04 and 2.20. We could have subtracted them to get a certain number. And depending on how large that number is, just like the last question, that would mean that's how strong the polar bonds are. So if the question would have said, <coughs> you know, look at A, B, and C and rate them in terms of most polar to least polar. And whichever one had the greatest difference between the two numbers when we subtracted the EN, val EN values, um, that would be the most polar. Okay? But that wasn't what the question was about. I'm just kind of saying, you know, if it was about that, that's what we would have done. Okay? So, we're getting close. All right, so this one's just kind of a review of the different types of forces that exist between molecules. And I just want to ask you guys, can you remember what London or dispersion forces are?
Okay. Well, let's start off. Are they strong forces or weak forces? That's right. They're weak forces. And London forces are just kind of uh, temporary charges that, that uh, molecules gain. You know, so as you have, you know, electrons are always moving around, and as they move around, you get some differences in the, um, let's say, the, uh, the way you spread out the charge throughout a molecule. And so, so one molecule will gain a bit of a charge, and when it comes in contact with another molecule, it will induce a charge in that molecule. But it's only a temporary charge, and it's a small charge. Okay? Now, dipole-dipole charges, what are those about? Yeah, it doesn't last too long. Okay, the dipole-dipole charge is basically the type of charge, or type of force, I should say, that we've been looking at just now. So, for instance, between oxygen and hydrogen, I'm just going to... Between oxygen and hydrogen, we've said that oxygen is going to become negative and hydrogen is going to become positive. Now well, that there is what you would call a polarity, and that's a dipole. So when we're talking about dipole-dipole forces, that's when the dipole between one molecule interacts with the dipole of another molecule. Okay? So if you're talking about uh, one water molecule has O having a negative, when that attracts the positive from another water molecule, that's going to be dipole dipole. Well, actually, I shouldn't have used uh, that as an example. Because what a hydrogen bond is, the difference between a hydrogen bond and a dipole dipole force is it's just slight. It's just that hydrogen, because it's got, there is such a large uh, polarity, because oxygen wants the electron so much, it's just a special type of um, dipole dipole force. So whenever you have a, a strong, uh, an element that really, really wants the electrons like oxygen or like chlorine, for instance, um, that's a dipole-dipole force, but because it's a strong one and the one element gets, you know, the electrons are spending most of their time near that element because it's got a really strong electronegativity, a hydrogen bond is just a special type of dipole-dipole force. Okay, so it's a dipole-dipole bond that involves an one element that has a high electronegativity, like oxygen. Okay? So that's the difference between your regular dipole-dipole and hydrogen. Now, do you guys remember the difference between intermolecular and intramolecular? Do you think of the example I gave last time? About the internet? <laughs> I hope you remembered. Do you remember, okay, sorry, I just, uh, I think I have to pull down something here so I can see what you've written, Jaren. I need to make the box bigger because for some reason I'm just seeing part of it. Ah, I think I've got it now. Okay, so you wrote, okay, intra is like everyone on the internet and intra is like our school. That's right. So inter is between molecules and intra is within molecules. That's exactly it. Yeah. You got it. So if you're looking at you know, water molecules, between different water molecules, that's inter, and within one water molecule, that's intra. Okay. Good stuff. So we're all done that one. And I just wrote a summary here. Uh, I don't even think we need to go over it. Do we, or would you like to just would you like me to read through it quickly? Okay. So first, London dispersion forces, temporary attractive forces between all molecules. An imbalance in charge induces a charge on a nearby molecule. These are weak forces. Okay. B, dipole, dipole, the attraction between polar molecules, the pole of one molecule is attracted to the pole of another molecule. Hydrogen bonds are strong dipole-dipole bonds with, when an element with a high electronegativity value bonds to hydrogen. Intermolecular are between atoms, molecules, or ions. Think the internet joins different computers. 
uh, intramolecular forces, so that's intra, within the same molecule, think cyber high is an intranet, we're all on the same computer. Okay, there we go. So, let me pull up the next one. Next question here is my best Aussie accent, if you feel like Aussie accents. <laughs> yeah, I was watching some show last night, there was an Aussie guy on it. <laughs> okay, so which of the molecules above are polar? Uh, we're just going to do two here, okay? So what I wrote here is to determine whether or not a molecule is polar, there's three steps you need to take. Hugh Jackman, okay? Hugh, who is Hugh Jackman? I know that name from somewhere, who is that? Oh, Wolverine, right, okay. I've never seen the show, I've, I've seen the actor, but I've never seen the show. Awesome. All right, I'll try to talk like Hugh Jackson. Yeah, I've never seen it. <laughs> I'm always watching movies with my kids, so hey, what can I say? Is it good? Actually, I want to see Ice Age. Have you guys seen Ice Age? I want to see it with my kids. But it hasn't come out in the $2 theater in Edmonton yet. Yeah, I like the first two. You know, like the little the little uh, chipmunk guy on it, who is always wanting to get his acorn and just never gets it. That is, that's classic. Is that what he's called, Scrat? Oh, <laughs> that is hilarious, man. All right, so guys, we're going to go through these. Uh, we're going to go through two examples. So when we want to find if a molecule is polar or not, we have to do a couple things. Step one, we need to draw the Lewis structure, okay? Once we get the Lewis structure, we can predict the shape. That's what we were doing last time, right? But a week ago, we were predicting shapes. And that was using page 55. Remember those examples on page 55? Now the third thing we do, once we know what the shape is, then we use a chart on page 59, and that chart will help us to determine whether it's polar or nonpolar. Okay, so let's let's use our textbooks. We're going to get into them here, and let's figure out the first one here whether it's polar or nonpolar. Okay, so the first one we've got is um, phosphorus trichloride. All right, so this is a molecular compound, and so we're going to go through the three steps. So first of all, I drew the Lewis diagram for each of those two atoms, and you can see that phosphorus has. Um, six, five outer electrons. <laughs> the reason, it's kind of funny, the reason I was thinking is six. When I was going through this earlier, there was a, a spec on my computer and I remember thinking, that's funny, I didn't think phosphorus had six. And then I took off the spec and I went, yeah, that's better, <laughs> should have five. So anyways, okay, you can see that uh, phosphorus does in fact have five outer electrons. Chlorine has six. Okay, so I wrote down here, phosphorus needs three electrons to bond with the three unpaired electrons. Okay, so these three guys here. And chlorine needs just one. So how are we going to make both atoms satisfied? Well, our solution is that we get each phosphorus bonds with three chlorine atoms. Okay? Yeah, it is, it is seven. There, there are seven here, right? There's two... 2, 2, and 1. Makes 7, right? Did I say 6? I'm sorry about that. Okay, so it should be 7. And so we can see that the way to solve the problem of uh, the unpaired electrons is each one of the chlorines is going to pair with, um, or rather, each one of the unpaired electrons in phosphorus is going to pair with one of the unpaired electrons in chlorine. So we're going to need three chlorines to, to make phosphorus happy. Okay? So I've drawn the structure here, and I haven't, <laughs> I haven't drawn all the bonds. I've, uh, I'm only drawing the unpaired electrons on top of phosphorus, because all the other ones are paired. So we're not going to worry about them. Okay. So we've got our structure here. And now, now that we've got our structure, we've got to figure out, okay, what's the shape of it going to be? So we'll go on to the next page. And so, on page... 55. So if you guys just want to turn to page 55, that's going to help us figure out what the shape is. So you guys there?
Okay, so you wrote trigonal planar. Okay. Now, trigonal planar is going to be AX3. And that would be the case if we didn't have any unpaired electrons. Okay? But it's going to be trigonal pyramidal because it's going to be AX3E. Does that make sense, Naomi? Okay, good stuff. All right, so it's going to be trigonal pyramidal. Now we know what it is. We know what the shape is. And now we can use the chart on page 59. So if you want to flip a couple pages over to 59, trigonal pyramidal. So what do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be polar or nonpolar? <laughs> so it's going to be polar, right? You're right. Good stuff. So that's all you need to do. Okay? Three steps involved. So we just use the two charts, one on page 55, one on 59. So that's the first example. And now let's go to the next one. The next one is going to be H2S2. I think we already discussed this at some point today, or maybe it was something else. I'm not sure. It might have been similar. So we're going to use the three steps again. So here again, I drew the Lewis dot diagram. Got H with one. And we've got six for sulfur. And so sulfur has two unpaired electrons. Each of them will bond with an unpaired electron of hydrogen. And so there's a structure. And all I've drawn, again, is the two unpaired electrons. OK. You're right. It's going to be bent. But here's the catch. Uh, so on page 55, it's AX2E2. So the shape is bent. But we also need to, to pay attention to the, the fact that it's tetrahedral electron group. OK? So when we go on page 59, um, it's, it's not going to be just the one that says bent, OK? That, you know, when you look on page 59, the third one down says bent, and it says polar. It's not going to be that, because what it's going to be, we, in this case, we look at the, the fact that it's got a tetrahedral electron group, and so it's going to be the, um, in this case, it's going to be nonpolar. OK? OK. So, um, Okay, the reason it's nonpolar is that the charges are going to even out. We don't have an, an imbalance. If we looked at our structure here and it was imbalanced, then we would have a polarity. But because everything's balanced, you know, if we have any charge up on top, that charge is balanced out with the charge on the bottom. H2, S2, even, balanced. That's right. OK, you can see, like when you look at the structure, you can see the H's on either side. They cancel out. It's a balanced arrangement. OK? But if it was an imbalanced arrangement, then you would have a polarity. OK? Now, I think, I'm not sure if this might be our last question. Just give me a sec here. It is. We're done. Awesome. We're, we're done within an hour. That's great. OK, what if it was H3 and S2? OK. So if there were three H's, um, now it would depend on how you look at it in three dimensions. If, they, if the three H's were arranged in such a way uh, that the things balanced out as far as left and right, up and down, then it would be nonpolar. But if they didn't balance out, let's try to think of an example from the textbook. Let me see if I can think of one. OK, I'm going to have to think on this as far as the three atoms coming out and see if I can come up with an example. And then I'll, I'll send you that over, OK? Because I can't think of one offhand. Well, I'll send you something over. OK, so guys, um, please uh, you know, get into assignment number four and just fire over the questions that you have. And uh, 
And again, remember we have the test coming up soon as well, okay? Okay, great stuff. So guys, thanks again for your participation. Really appreciate it. And uh, by the way, I saw some of that beaver buzz stuff you were talking about last time. I saw that at the store. So I almost bought it, but <laughs> didn't quite. Bought some chocolate instead, so I still got my sugar, sugar fix. Okay. Well, uh, just send that in. You know, Naomi, just uh, you know, fire over questions that you have, and uh, you know, and if if you guys want to do this one on one on one sometimes as well, we can do that. Okay. And again, I mentioned last time about uh, if you guys want to pair up, we can do that as well, and I can show you how to set yourself up on Illuminate, or we can, you can do WizIQ. You know, and that way, I think with either WizIQ or Illuminate, the free version you can get you can get uh, three people working on it. So. Uh, just let me know if you want to do that. You bet. Anytime. So uh, have an awesome day, guys. And uh, it's been great chatting with you. And I will let you go. All right. Take care, guys.